Hey, friends. So, today I've somehow found myself drawn back into one of my favorite themes, which is music as a domain of well, what I would call spiritual practice or spiritual, not even practice, um, presence. And this notion has kind of popped up, you know, like a firework going off here and there over the last couple of months. Madeline, my, my, uh, piano teacher mentioned it very specifically on one of our final um, lessons in the teacher training program that just concluded, and, and where she was basically saying that she, uh, she recognized that many, many musicians have an almost religious level of dedication and devotion to the craft of making music and and that that is not misplaced because there really is a kind of compulsion and I know this from my own from my own practice there is a there's a level of compulsion to grow in music to to expand my my not just my skill set at sort of from a technical musical music making point of view but but also from a from a larger experiential point of view grow my ability to feel music and and perceive music and and it's amazing to me um you know like i i metal and mentioned something in a in a separate instance about Chogyam Trungpa, who was her spiritual teacher, going to a concert of, of uh, Beethoven and Mozart and just being blown away and completely um, talking about the kind of spiritual wisdom that was, that was in this music being expressed through some of the great composers. And so I think part of what led me back into this, into this um, realm and, and sort of what brought this back online for me is, is the last couple of days, if you've heard my posts, I've been talking about Alan Jones's book, The Scandal of God, which is a really interesting exploration of um, the nature of, of belief, the nature of faith, I would say the kind of the, one of the central things he's treating is um, some of the wrong turns that fundamentalism takes, fundamentalism in any form, whether we're talking about scientific positivism, atheistic fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism, um, and, and, and I, and I really feel like the book is zeroing in on that element in the kind of, it's, it's both, it's both in the spiritual realm and also in the social, even political realm that we see these kind of wrong terms in the thinking where it's like there's a, a set of beliefs that is actually doing a pretty good job and and and, ha, and and a lot of times we're talking about you know philosophies or theologies mythologies that have been around for a long time and they um they've they've formed a a, a foundation for human meaning making through the narratives that they that they are, they've formed a foundation for human meaning making that has that has survived for literally millennia sometimes. And 
and so, but but Alan is 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 really sort of uh, he's really kind of observant and pen and I think penetrating about about talking about where where it's a matter of the beliefs, the actual sort of content, and the, and where it's a matter of our way of holding the beliefs. What how what are we you know, do it as I was talking about yesterday. Do we do we have an open space? Do we have an open heart? Do we make space for the for the unknown? And when we encounter the unknown in our own experience, what do we do? Do we try to do we try to just close that loop and say, well, I know what's over there. It's his name is God and he does this and this and this and he wants me to do this and this and this and that. Therefore, you should do this and this and this. And before you know it, we're into a kind of fundamentalistic, fundamentalist way of looking at things and way of prescribing what needs to happen. And, that, and, and the unknown is no longer unknown. We can't handle the unknown. Um, or do we come to that unknown and kind of have, I think what Alan might call faith and allow that faith to, to, to hold the space open. There's a beautiful image in the, in the portion of the book that I was listening to yesterday, where he talks about having a conversation, an ongoing conversation that never ends. The conversation will never end. As long as there are people on earth, as long as there's a manifest realm, a realm of duality, a realm, as Sai Guru would describe, of karma, of cyclicality, of compulsion, as long as this realm that we all know and love as the world exists, we're going to have to keep talking about what we mean by God or the transcendent or the unknown, or the source. And any, almost any vocabulary will do, whether it's from the atheist's point of view, or the scientist's point of view, or the mystic's point of view, the religious believer's point of view, as long as we're careful with what we mean by that, all of these perspectives and, and, and vocabularies are, are, are going to have something to say and they'll be, they will be capable of having the conversation on a, on, a, on a very deep level. But what I love about music as a spiritual dimension is that it, it has it clearly has meaning. It so clearly contains truth and, and visceral, emotionally palpable narrative. A piece of a, a Beethoven symphony or a Mozart symphony is a narrative. Otherwise, we wouldn't be compelled by it. And it wouldn't have any meaning for us. It wouldn't have the effect that it does. Why do people go to piano concerts and cry? Why do people go to the symphony and and weep? Well, there's some kind of meaning that we're receiving from that, from, from, from the music. Um, and I'm talking here very kind of specifically about mu not, not, not songs that have lyrics where the meaning is at least partially contained in the lyric, but music that doesn't have any lyrics where you can't, there's no, there's no confusion about whether or not we're talking about linguistic, literal meaning or whether we're talking about a, another level of meaning that is a, that's, that's much more intuitively grasped and that is in a lot of ways much more universal because lyrics, when you sing lyrics, well, you got to pick a language. Music without lyrics you don't have to pick a language. It's not happening. It's happening in its own musical language. And what's being communicated is therefore at least ostensibly universally graspable, universally receivable. And 
and that's what I, that's the, one of the things that I keep coming, I think that keeps bringing me back to both a curiosity about this and, and, and a fascination with it, and also a desire to kind of unpack it a little, is the fact that it seems as though classical music has a relatively universal effect on listeners from all cultures. It's not like there are cultures who listen to Mozart and go, ah, that's, that's kind of leaves me cold. I don't know that, that, I don't get it. I just don't get why that was great. <laughs> it, it doesn't really happen. You know, the, even the, the, the classical musicians across the globe, across cultures that are literally at war with each other, they're all practicing the same classical music on the on their instruments. What does that say about the universality of music as a as a spiritual dimension? It's a huge that, that's a huge um, I feel like it's a huge opportunity or a huge a huge kind of potential revelation because it, it because it's it inherent you know the narrative of music the narrative of classical music or just you know you, it could be jazz just the narrative of music that you know that is not sung that doesn't doesn't happen in any given language or in any given set of lyrics the narrative of that music unites us it unites us in the in the emotional experience of what of, of, of a kind of deep human archetypal resonance with certain kinds of emotional tension and release and flow and rising and falling and oceanic powerful forces that that are exp that are there in the music that that we that people from all countries and all cultures and all backgrounds tend to resonate with and i'm not i'm not trying to say that you know i'm not trying to claim that because obviously i can't experience music from the point of view of every culture it just seems to be my observation that all cultures resonate with with music in in in, in a in a largely universal way it would be pretty rare for two people to go to the same symphony and go, yeah, I, th I thought that was really sad and I thought that was really happy. You know, to be completely divergent and just not seeing eye to eye. It's possible. It's, it's absolutely possible. Um, but, I, but I also find mo more often than not in my experience, there's a universal... It's almost like by, you know, music gives us the opportunity to tap into a kind of archetypal realm that that contains narrative but on a level that is that is not limited by the kind of linear literal nature of 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 human language it takes us to another place and so, as I'm in the midst of this book of Alan's that is all about having a conversation, having a universal, having a conversation about the universal human experience and transcending some of the barriers, some of the, some of the, um, some of the, some of the, barriers to communication across different vocabularies and perspectives music <laughs> shows up pretty large as a way for me to, to to kind of get a glimpse of that and potentially you know access a language that that would that would allow us to talk on a deeper level to communicate on a deeper level so that's what i got today folks thanks for watching much love. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.